Hey there, welcome back to the Nikhil Hogan Show. What a treat today. I'm so pleased to introduce my guest, harpsichordist, improviser, and conductor, Dr. Ewald de Meira. Professor de Meira studied at the Royal Conservatoire of Antwerp, obtaining his master's degree for harpsichord in Jos van Immersiel's class. On completion of his studies in 1997, he was engaged as a teacher of harmony, counterpoint, and fugue by the Royal Conservatoire of Antwerp. In 2002, he succeeded Jos van Immersiel as professor of harpsichord, and he is also a professor at IMEP in Belgium. A specialist in early music, partimento, and counterpoint, he was the winner of the CPE Bach Counterpoint Contest. As a recording artist, he has recorded many albums, including Tears, Harpsichord Laments of the 17th Century, 18th Century Flemish Harpsichord Music, Telemann Le Nations, Overture and Oboe Concertos, Mozart's Grand Partita, and many more. Ewald, it's such an honor to have you on the show today. Thank you so much for that wonderful introduction. <laughs> <laughs> Let's start at the beginning. How old were you when you started music? I guess music has always been a part of my life. My parents are both amateur musicians, so classical music, or I, I should say rather uh, music in general, was always present in our house. And actually my mom played already the harpsichord when I was very, very, very young. So there was an instrument at home and my parents were good friends to a quite well-known organist in Belgium, Roger de Rue, who was the, the main organist of the Cathedral of Bruges. And they were singing in, in, in more than one of his choirs. And they asked him what keyboard instrument would be best suited for me. And he said, yeah, obviously harpsichord, because it offers the most possibilities of playing together, playing alone, playing uh, so chamber music, orchestral things, etc. Did you start piano lessons or harpsichord lessons really young? I was actually, if I remember well, I was the first person being able to start with harpsichord, not being obliged to start with piano at the music at academy. So I started immediately with harpsichord, but my teacher, uh, Karin Verhenemann, found it also important that during, uh, during the road, so to speak, I also did uh, some piano. So she also taught me the piano. And I've always been playing the piano, so I never, I never stopped playing piano, but I don't consider myself a pianist, so I'm modest. Do you have absolute or perfect pitch? Yes, but I don't find that so interesting. I often find that rather a burden than a help. What I find much more, what I, I mean much more, what I find absolutely paramount for a musician, especially for a, a keyboard player who wants to improvise, is a, a harmonic ear. Because if you have perfect pitch, the problem is that when switching instruments or when switching pitch, so for instance, when I play, I would say Bach on a, on a keyboard, I would play at four uh, at four fifteen hertz. When I play, let's say French music like like Couperin, François Couperin, then I go half a tone even even lower. When I play Mozart, I go even above four fifteen. So that's for someone who has perfect pitch. That's quite a challenge to to adapt. Does it bother you when you have to play in, in these different frequencies? Let's say that now I'm, I'm used to it. But in the beginning, it was, quite, it was quite a test. And I remember well one of the first productions I did with La Petite Bande in the, in the 90s. It was a French program, so with uh, Rameau, Rebel, etc. And I remember that Rio Terracado, who was, the, um, who was the concertmaster at that time, he came to me to tune his violin. And he came with a note, which for me was a G. And I was thinking, that's so strange. Why does he come with a G? And I was playing on my keyboard. And actually, of course, he was playing an A. But, I mean, it's a full tone lower than, than modern pitch. And I remember that well. And I thought, yeah, I, I have to do something about that. Because I have to adapt myself. Because it cannot be, cannot be a burden. It, it, I just have to let it go and really be in the pitch and listen 
more and more, if that is even possible, more and more harmonically than than just listen to the to the absolute pitch of the notes. Can I ask you a question? Did you improvise as a child? I guess I always I have always been improvising from right from the start. My 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 teacher at the academy had let's say the brilliant idea of having me play basso continuo right from the start. I remember well that I started yeah with playing small harpsichord pieces and then very 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 early on she gave me a basso continuo I, I remember it was a it was a cello sonata and even in facsimile right on from from the very first moment it's like being thrown into um, how does one say that in English thrown into the depth of uh, <laughs> the deep end of the pool yeah deep of the pool exactly and I remember that well, and she just explained me a couple of a couple of basic things that a five means this, a six means this, and then she sent me home, and I got inspired by that, and that really I felt something special about it because it stimulated my my brain and it stimulated my creativity, and I guess that was really the start of um let's say an approach to music which is not at all reproductive but which is creative and which is something which I try to do with everything I do, not just reproducing the notes, but I mean, the, mu- the, the notation is not the music to quote Bartolt Keuken. So that has been from right from the start, very important. And she also encouraged me to compose. So during my, my young life, let's say my, my, my education in the, in the music school consisted of three somewhat parallel and overlapping domains. So there was the solo repertoire, there was the basso continuo repertoire, and there was the the composing repertoire. And during concerts and during, uh, I mean, class concerts, etc., and exams, I could even perform my own pieces. So she was very, she was very, I mean, she was very important for me, just in stimulating my, my, I guess my, my musical mind, I would say. How was the culture around your improvisation at the time? Were people encouraging, enthusiastic? Obviously, your teacher was. But isn't it the case that in classical music, improvisation is quite rare? It is. It was completely rare. And I think I was, I was the exception, let's say. I mean, I have to say another thing, because I, I already spoke about that organist, Roger de Rubeu, who was also a brilliant improviser. And as you know, the organists are perhaps, um, or were perhaps, or that's that's restarting perhaps now. But anyway, the organists were, let's say, the last species, yeah. <laughs> so to say, uh, to, 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 to maintain, to keep improvisation as a core business within their daily life. So that that organist always encouraged me because I mean he was he he's, he was a good friend he still is a good friend he's well into his nineties but he's still among us uh, thankfully um, he was always very he encouraged me always very very strongly to know harmony to know counterpoint to know fugue to improvise and really to let's say to get loose from the written notes. And that, so I had I had main influences in, in, in that time, yeah, already to make this this path towards 18th century thinking, because at that time, obviously, Partimento was not quite yet, I mean, was not, not, not discovered, I didn't discover it yet. So the models were perhaps somewhat different or, or perhaps somewhat less organized than than, uh, than they are today. But there was a definite stimulation with, with being creative and being active uh, at the key. So you are well known as really a specialist and expert in Parlamento. Before you so, sort of discovered Parlamento and music schema, was your approach kind of, you mentioned basso continuo general bass, and you won the CPE contest, the award. Did you read his book, his treatise and improvisation in a different way from Partimento before that? Exactly, exactly. Actually, when you read CPE, uh, when you read, read the treatise, you have to read it. I wanted to say a couple of times, but even you have to you have to re uh, read it seven, eight, nine, <laughs> ten times because it's <laughs> it's so dense, it's so complicated, and you always see. Yeah, different different things, and it 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 it, it really it's really hard to get uh, to get to the bottom of it. But it, it I mean it's so rich, it's so profound, and I guess that 
that also is um, yeah is is a difficulty, especially when you read the second volume, which is dedicated to Basso Continuo and, let's be honest, very modestly to uh, improvisation. I mean, if you want to learn to improvise from Carl Philippe Emanuel, you will not succeed because it's not a method. It's an, it's, uh, I mean, he gives a tremendous amount of information, but it's very, very, very difficult to assimilate all that information. I mean, the, the core business of his, of his treaties is explaining how the figures work. And he gives a huge amount of them. And he gives very, 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 very detailed information on how to realize those figures. And you have to know that his era is, in his time, one played continual in a completely different way that in, than compared with, uh, you know, with, with the era of Johann Sebastian Bach. There is a real uh, style break, one could say. So you won the counterpoint contest. How did you study counterpoint? What was your approach before Parlamento? It was very instinct-like, I would say. I followed, I guess, the path that a lot of, of my colleagues uh, followed. On the one hand, you have the severe counterpoint, a la, a la Fuchs, which has hardly anything to do with music, if I dare to say. <laughs> let's shock some people. Yeah, that's um, right. yeah. And then, obviously, when one thinks of 18th century music and, and 18th century uh, counterpoint, you cannot deny Johann Sebastian Bach. But the problem with Johann Sebastian Bach is that he is on, he is on such, a, such a high level, on such an, an exceptional um, level, that he is not a very good model for a student because his writing is so exceptionally exceptional that it's so overwhelming to when 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 as a, as a, I mean as a student or even as a teacher when you try to make his writing into I would say into a method or into a rules by which you can organize a standard and by which you can make students work. So what I tried is to go to what they call today lesser, kleinere maestri, so smaller maestri, and then from those. From those compositions, it's often easier to yeah to 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 show students how counterpoint can work in 18th century uh, language. Now, can you describe how you came to Parlamento? That's very easy. I saw a flyer in Belgium. I think it was 2002 or 2003. I I, I don't remember the right uh, year anymore by a certain Giorgio Sanguinetti, <laughs> you <laughs> obviously, obviously know. And he came to Ghent and he, he, he gave a lecture, a two-day uh, lecture, if I remember well, on Partimento. And then there was a little text explaining that this was the method, the method by which uh, all the great composers in the 18th century uh, learned their craft from a very early age, and as you know, a craft which uh, is absolutely stunning if you look at all the, the great 18th century Italian Neapolitan composers yeah, who wrote uh, such a great amount uh, of great music that immediately stimulated me uh, to attend that seminar by uh, Professor Sanguinetti. And at the same time, I immediately felt mm, this is something which I need not only for myself to improve my insights into 18th century yeah, music, improvisation, understanding uh, the, way, the way of composing, but obviously also for me as a teacher, because I, I've always been intrigued by the fact that one should not put walls in, intrigued is the wrong word, I've always been convinced, that I wanted to say, I've been always convinced about the fact that one should not put walls in between what has been separated since, I mean, uh, since the 19th century. You have, at the one hand, you have the instrumental course, at the other hand, you have the harmony course, at the other hand, you have the practical harmony course, you have counterpoint. No, I really wanted to 
to teach music, and I, I, I'm, I'm doing that more than ever. I think my students can, can, uh, can confirm that. When I'm teaching harpsichord today, I'm speaking about harmony. I'm speaking about partimento. I'm speaking about performance practice. I'm speaking about, uh, about improvisation. There should not be, those courses should not be, not be individual courses. courses. There should be, this is one, one course. That's a good 10 years at least before he released his monograph, The Art of Partimento. And so how did you begin to get into it? What things did you work on? Right from the start, you, I, I could find some material. Actually, actually uh, Professor Sanguinetti gave us an, a very nice, I should say, a synopsis uh, of, the, of, the, of the rules. I mean, he gave a little, a little package of, uh, of Partimenti. And I started to, to, to study them. And then I remember that fairly quickly I came across Robert Gerdingen. And then, obviously, I saw the huge potential of, the, of what Robert Gerdingen yeah, gave, uh, uh, so to speak. If you compare what Mr. Sanguinetti does and what Mr. Gerdingen uh, does, they actually look at the same thing, but with, with, with different glasses. Professor Sanguinetti looks at 18th century music, how to arrive at improvisation, at composition, really from the method, really from Partimento, really from how Partimento was taught within the Neapolitan school. And then what Mr. Gerdingen does is that he obviously did the same thing because in his book there is an, an addendum uh, dedicated to, um, to Partimento. But he starts rather from compositions, from comparing compositions and from analyzing them from schematic point of view. What is uh, similar between a minuet of Mozart and a minuet of Boccherini, so to speak. How did those composers build up their compositions? And there you see that at least the idea of Partimento with, it, I mean, this, this schematic thinking, so you have one phrase which is followed by another phrase, which is logically followed by another phrase, is actually the basis, so to speak, of in between the parentheses in between brackets every 18th century composer when you approach it from partimento or when you approach it from from the schematic point of view eventually you will arrive at the same result because you cannot state that mozart for instance who is perhaps the most yeah if one dare say the 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 the, 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 the ideal gallant composer he did not arrive at his result through partimento education but he did arrive at the result through his yeah, schematic education via, via his father. So you see that the same, the same result is achieved somehow by somewhat different, different methods, so to speak. You're known for being a real expert on Fenaroli. And so did you begin to tackle his partimenti exercises and look at his materials? What I find so stimulating with the Partimenti of Finaroli, indeed, he's one of my um, one of my friends. I, <laughs> I can say even uh, in the meantime, what I find so amazing. I mean, there are two things for me which are which are so amazing. At the one hand, his method is arguably the the best, in a sense that I've been studying so many manuscripts of his partimenti and they are they are they, they show of they show actually very similar contents there is a small evolution within the partimento corpus of finaroli at the beginning of his career there were lesser partimento less, lesser partimento in his full corpus than later on and at the very end of his life he decided to write even a, f a full blown new book with complex uh, partimenti. But aside from that, what you see is a constant concern for gradual increase of complexity. So the method is so beautiful. He starts easily in his first book with the main 
with the main rules, so to speak. I won't get, I won't get technical now. Oh, you can, please. Yeah. So he just, oh, that's fantastic. So he just starts with cadences. No, that, that's, an, that's a fairly easy, a, easy thing yeah, to conceive. And then he, in the same book, he obviously wants also the rule of the octave to be known. The rule of the octave, which was a, which was a tool for the student to know which chord to play on every note of the scale, I mean, in the left hand, when the left hand, when the bass moves stepwise. So each, when you have a do -di 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 on each note, the student had to know, had to learn which chord to play. This is basically the, mat the material for the first book. He must have introduced already modulation because right from the start, from his very first partimento, you see that he wants his students already to get acquainted with a real musical situation. It starts in G major. After a couple of bars, he goes to D major, and then he comes back to G major. And exactly that is, for me, one of the things which touches me so much, because he is, as perhaps every partimento teacher, he is so concerned with an actual musical situation. He does not want to instruct students into music theory. He wants to instruct pupils into music practice. And you see right from the start that his partimenti are very small but real musical compositions. And gradually, gradually, the partimenti get bigger and bigger. And there I have to make the link to the research and the work of Mr. Gierdingen. You see that the, ski, the, the schemas that are discussed within Mr. Gierdingen's famous book on the gallant, gallant style all appear within the uh, partimenti of Fenaroli. And exactly at the places where they should occur. Because this is this is this is absolutely astonishing, uh, an astonishing observation. What uh, Robert Gerding has has uh, has achieved, he he he, his one of one of the things which is so fascinating about his work is that not only he identified so many schemas, but more. What is what is even more important for me is that a certain schema has a certain place by preference in a certain composition. And this means that when you look at the Partimenti of Fenaroli, those specific, in Italian we call them Moti del Basso, will occur at specific places within the Partimento. This does not mean that they cannot occur in other places, obviously, but the student had to learn his craft. And so, for instance, when a piece is in G major, you get the logical modulation to D major, I mean, towards the middle of the piece, after which Finaroli very, very often, but really very often, introduces a fonte, because that was the place to put a fonte. And so you really see the concern of Finaroli right from the start to train his students to become a professional musician, to learn music, not to learn about music. And this is for me, yeah, this is so, so amazing and so important that when I, when I teach myself, that I can make the connection with living music, that when I have a piano student who, let's be honest about it, the piano student often has focus on the, on the pianism, has a focus on, on playing his six, seven, eight hours a day. And if I can show them that when they play a Mozart sonata, that they should play the, re the repeats, that the repeat is not there to annoy them or to, <laughs> let, or to be left out. What they do mostly, they leave out the, the repeat because they don't know um, often what, what, I mean, they are annoyed with it or they don't know what to do with it. But if you know the language from within, in the repeat you can change things. You could, you could change even a complete, a complete uh, moto del basso. You could change the decoratio. You could add, you could add some ornaments, etc., etc., etc.
You mentioned modulation in Fender Roll Leaf right from the earliest Partimenti, but I was curious. He doesn't really discuss mutation, right, in his rules. I think you can you can find that in Furno, but you can't find that in Fenneroli's rules. So are there are there some things that are missing, so to speak, within his rules? Uh, there are a lot, a lot, a lot of things missing in his rules. His rules are really, I would say, rudimentary, and he even. I can't remember. I think it's in his preface or in his, or, or right at the end of his of his regule that he says that if one finds mistakes or if one sh- feels the necessity of adding rules, please do. So you see, that's really it's really an, an it's it's an it's it's a starting point. It's it's an um, it's really rudimentary, and it also shows the huge importance of. The one-to-one contact. It it shows the, the 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 relation, so to speak, of mentor and disciple. That they had this. I mean, you know, in 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 in, in Neapolitan uh, um, education, there was this oral tradition. You had the teacher, you had the student, and they they, they had a lot of lesson, and very intense relationship. And of course, when you have on a fairly daily basis lesson. There is no need to notate so much. Hence, the difficulty for us to understand this training, what this training really consisted of. Hence, also the fact that it took so long, that is one of the reasons that it took so long to discover this training. I mean, if I look at, uh, I've studied the counterpoint courses of several of Finaroli students. So there is um, a, a beautiful a beautiful manuscript, I mean, there, there, there are more of them, by a certain Biaccio Musco Giuri, who followed counterpoint in the 80s, amongst others, I mean, with Finaroli, but also with, a, with an assistant of Finaroli. And there I've made, a, I've made a study of trying to, let's say, trying to find the rules just from analyzing, from playing all the counterpoint exercises. And one of the things which, which struck me was the amount of things Finaroli had to add during the courses to be able at arriving at such an incredibly high level of counterpoint, of the quality of the, of the counterpoint, the quality of composition, if one, if one can say, is astonishing, astonishingly high. There is a second one, a second counterpoint course which I studied, which is a little more known than Musco Giuri. This is the counterpoint course by La Vigna, which is the beginning of the 90s, first half of the of the 90s. Uh, You're which talking was about all 1790s, right? Not the 1990s. 19... <laughs> yes, yes. yeah, Not yeah. talking about the Backstreet Boys here, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> not, not quite, I would say. And there you see the amount of exercises they had to write is absolutely astonishing. Hundreds and hundreds of pages of of high, high, high quality of composition slash like, com- counterpoint slash composition, and this explains why those students, why those composers had such a such a craft. And this is this is one of the things I I I, I, I try to explain students now that if they want to achieve a high level in whatever. Um, Whatever area they have to invest in themselves. Okay, this is perfect. This is leads me right into how we can get into this, getting to a high level of partimenti realization. Now you've really been looking at this at a long time. You mentioned earlier that CPE box treatise is very difficult to get you to improvise. Clearly, Fenaroli is much easier. Progressively, it allows you to start to do this, but some things are missing. So, let's say you had a kid, and you've already mentioned learn the cadences, learn the rule of the octave in the first book, learn the scale mutations. Now, how would you craft for a new young musician, uh, someone who's fresh to this? How would you craft a plan for them to get to a high level of realization for Partimenti? That's an excellent question, and one of the things. Which, if I stick to to, to Finaroli, which is which is um, the the method I know uh, I know best, uh, let's say, when I look at his concern, is that in the beginning he starts with full voiced sonorities, so to speak. So he wants to he wants his students to learn the rule of the octave first, not the cadences. That's also an interesting an, an interesting fact. 
Anyway, anyhow, it's, it's like this. And he let them play the rule of the octave with full chords. And is that, is that um, three voices in the right hand? Even more, even more. I would say even almost 10, 10, the 10 digits on the, on the, on the keyboard. <laughs> wow. Really big, big, big chords. And there is not a concern in the beginning for voice leading. So you get parallels, no problem. But they get acquainted to, I will say, I would say to the sonorities on each scale step of the, of the scale. And then they go to, they can go to the partimento playing and play it in a very rudimentary way. In a sense that when you have a, a half note, imagine that we are in 4-4, you have two half notes in the first bar, followed by four quarter notes in the second bar. Instead of already trying to make it musically interesting, the first step to do is that this partimento player is that he plays the full chords, that he that he understands that a certain bass note implies a certain sonority. And depending on the level of the student, this takes more or less time. So this depends. So wait a second, as an example, so let's take number one, book one. So how would you want somebody to start with that one? You're, you're saying full sonority, as many voices as you can? Absolutely. So this means that basically, when you look at the first bars, you see that there are only quarter notes. So this means you will play every correct sonority on each bass note. Then when you come into, what is it, bar one, two, three, four, five, in bar, in bar six, Finaroli stops his quarter note movement and he switches into half note movement. The first step there is to really respect the basic sonorities, so when you have that C sharp, just play the this, this, this six five chord. When you have the D, just play the D major chord. When you have the A in the next bar, just play the A uh, major chord. This is the first step. But obviously, and this is one of the things which is so important also within the, within the Partimento tradition, this is that harmonic rhythm right from the start is introduced within the method. Look at the cadences. The cadences teach that when the bass note takes one beat within the bar, you play cadenza semplice, one chord. However, when the bass note takes two beats within the bar, instead of making an, I mean, let's say, musically uninteresting solution by changing position in the right hand, the Partimento student is immediately introduced to a thing which they see much later, which will be um, made explicit much later, but with from, with from the start, which is already in their repertoire, namely a suspension. So they will play a cadenza composta, and they already get this musically real situation with a suspension right from the start. And this you, you see uh, in, this, in the first Partimento by, by Finaroli, you see exactly the same thing. Finaroli gives a C-sharp lasting half a bar, so lasting, lasting two beats. It's the task of the, of the student when he knows first that he has to play a 6-5 chord. It's his task to come up with a musical, sol musical solution to make those two beats interesting. One interesting solution to that problem is instead of playing that beautiful sonority of 6-5 vertically, he can play that beautiful sonority horizontally. So instead of playing the A-G together vertically, he can first play a 6 chord and then having the diminished fifth as a horizontal melodical note following the A to arrive on the F sharp in the middle of the bar. One could even go one step further and making that, that logic, applying that logic also to the middle of that bar. Because there we have the problem that we have two, two beats of D. How can we make that, that second half of that bar more interesting, giving a musical solution to it? Obviously, it's by introducing a dissonance, introducing a suspension. 
which they already knew thanks to the cadenza composta. So in this case, the soprano could be la dum ti dum. So postponing the F sharp until the fourth beat, replacing it with a four on the middle of that bar. This is a gradual process, and with Finaroli, I find it, I find it so stimulating that he anticipates regole, which are dealt with, I would say, uh, more elaborately later within the course. I have a question now. How about the minor? The, the rules are similar, but what about if you're having to deal with the raised six and seven and the natural six and seven in the minor mode? How do you get over that confusion? There are two things which seem contradictory, which a student has to, has to get. There is obviously, at the one hand, melodical idea in the bass. Because the rule of the octave proposes, suggests a solution to give a chord on every successive scale step of any scale. So this means if I want to go from, I mean, let's keep G because we, we just we, we just had this, this partimento in G major, let's go to G minor. So this means when I go from D and I want to, to, to go up uh, by step, the only possibility of avoiding that, I, that, I'm, that I'm obliged to go down when I go from D to E flat, when I, when I sing Re, Mi, I'm obliged to go back to Re. However, when I want to go up, I'm obliged to, um, to raise that E flat to E natural. Because I give this E natural, this E natural obliges me to go on to the F sharp. That F sharp, which obliges me to go on to the G. So first, it's very important that the student understands this melodical aspect of the scale. And the other, and, and the other way around, of course, it's, 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 it's similar. When you go down from the high G and you want to go to the D, from the moment that you play F sharp, you are in trouble. Because if you play F sharp, you are obliged to go, to go I mean... You can still descend chromatically, but that is too early in the in the in the method. Normally, when you play F sharp, you go back up to the G. So he, when he wants to go down, he has to lower the F sharp into F natural. He has to lower the. I mean, he has to not lower, but 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 really respect the normal sixth scale step. So this is the E flat going to the D. So this is a melodical aspect going up. You have to raise six and seven. Going down, they appear in their lowered uh, guise. And it feels completely natural after you do it for a while. It feels completely natural because it's a note with an, with an, with an, an obligation, with a directional obligation, if that is English. Because we have... From the moment I sing... You immediately hear one, you immediately hear one. And then when I go down, you have one, 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 one. When I, when I want to go down and I sing, well, I'm in trouble because this F sharp in 95% of cases really implies one, one to go up again. So this is the first thing that the student has to understand. And then obviously, there is the harmonical, um, the harmonical aspect, and if you read Finaroli, this is this is a bit a bit a bit funny. Even I would say, is that going up, no problem. The the explanation is clear, but going down, you see that there is a kind of a kind of a tension within within what the what, what, what the left hand does and what the right hand does, because what the left hand does really. Um, um, I would say respects the scale of G minor, while the right hand wants to touch upon upon D minor. No major. No, it's still G minor. So it, it gets a little bit a little bit confusing, which obviously is the wonderful uh, augmented sixth chord. So you have the E flat in the bass, and you have the you have the C sharp combined with the A and the G, which gives this yeah amazing amazing sonority, which for them was was normal sonority, but which keeps on, yeah, for me being, being really 
amazing. So this tension between the melodical element and it's this is such a basic a basic thing of partimento thinking, thinking in scale steps, the one hand, and then putting the right chord, the right sonority in the right hand. This is what makes this this method so so fascinating and so direct and so excellent because there is no break, mental break in between theory and practice. If I say to you, can you play can you play for me a third inversion of a dominant seven chord in E flat major, when I say, we need a little moment of okay, that's the one. <laughs> there, there, there is some mental activity which slows down somewhat the the the, 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 the process. And they were not trained in that in, in that way. They were trained in seeing the bass A flat and knowing when it goes down there is a six four two chord or a four four two chord on it. So it's the it's the 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 the, the the immediate reaction which I find so so great in the complete in the complete method actually. Talking about the dissonances, the second, the four, the seven, the nine, what's a good way to really get that good into your into your playing? You have to make a distinction between the dissonances in the right hand and the dissonances in the left hand. Let's start with the dissonances in the left hand. Finaroli, he's not the only one, but he makes a very interesting, he gives a very interesting explanation. I will start with the first suspension in the bass, which they learned. Imagine that you are in C major and you introduce a C on a weak beat. And then that C is tied over towards the strong beat. So there the partimento player already knows, aha, this will be or this becomes a dissonant note. That C in the bass on the strong beat is a dissonant note. Then afterwards that C will descend to B. The partimentist, uh, the partimento uh, um, student has to look then to the next note to know what chord to play on the moment of dissonance. Because Finaroli explains, when you have, I will sing it, it will be clear, C, B, C. When you have this, Finaroli explains that the moment of dissonance has to be accompanied with 4-2. And actually, he says, with the minor fourth, which we, in modern terms, would call the pure uh, fourth. That's the first thing. However, when the bass line continues to descend after the B instead of going back to the C, so um, C, B, A, G. When you have this line, Finaroli says that the moment of dissonance does not require the minor fourth, but the major fourth, which we would call the augmented fourth. So this implies actually a scale mutation because we leave the scale of C and we go into the scale of G major. So that's a huge one. That's a very, very important one. And actually you all, you, you, you know this piece, the first prelude of Johann Sebastian Bach does exactly this. Of Voltempelier de Clavier, it is exactly this um, this illustration, I would say, of the two four two chords on the on the on the first scale step. So there are other ones, but let let just I, I want to stick just with, with with that in the bass. Obviously, this is easy to I mean easy. This is not negotiable, I would say, because this is this is the rule. This is the regole. When you have a weak beat note and it be, and it, it is prolonged until a strong beat, it requires dissonance. Voilà. That is that's a basic thing. You mentioned the left hand in the bass. What about the right hand in the dissonances? When you have a consonant chord, so this means basically a fifth chord or a sixth chord, and those chords or that chord takes longer than one beat in the bar. Now I'm giving very elementary uh, rules, eh? but if that basic consonant chord takes more than one beat, the reaction of the partimento player would be, or should be, aha, I cannot just plainly play that normal chord 
because this would musically not be so interesting. What is the first reaction he will have? I will add a dissonance to it. So this means that imagine in C major that you have at a certain point, you have a C on beat three and four. Instead of just giving that C on the third beat immediately with a consonant chord of C major, obviously in the right hand, the first reaction of the partimento player would be to add a dissonance on the third beat and play the normal chord, the actual consonant chord on the fourth beat. And there he has three options to do that. First option is to replace the third with the fourth. Option two is to replace the doubling of the fundamental note, so the doubling of the bass, doubling of the, of the, of the C, with the ninth. And obviously, the combination of both gives the third possibility. So in that case, you get a 9, 4, 8, 3 um, texture or, 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 uh, or dissonance. When you have a sixth chord, you have lesser possibilities. Actually, there is basically only one. It means that you will replace the sixth by the seventh. So this is, this is in a very, very short, very short explanation of how dissonance adds actually musical interest within partimento thinking. You've been teaching partimento. Uh, you have a lot of experience teaching it. What are some common mistakes or common challenges you find practically for your students learning this material? Where are the things that really slow them down? It's changing the basic realization into musical realization. Playing the chords is fairly simple because, I mean, when you know the rule of the octave well, when you know the exceptions to the rule of the octave well, when you, know, when you, when you know your cadences, then playing a partimento, a simple partimento by Finaroli is not so hard because they are really the application of what has been learned in an abstract way. Taking it one step further, so this implies changing the, this texture, this multi-voiced texture, into the typical idiomatic keyboard texture, that means a tree-voiced uh, texture, which is hard for the student. Playing full chords without any voice leading, this goes fairly, fairly quickly. Changing this texture into a beautiful three-part texture with, with two upper voices, let's say as if you would compose a piece with, for two violins and, and, and basso continuo, this is where, um, where it gets, for a lot of students, I would say a little, a little, uh, a little difficult. What's the solution? The solution uh, is that they have to know certain basic principles. First principle is that Finaroli wants his students to learn textures. When you look at the end, for instance, of his second partimento, you already, see, you already see this concern for introduction of textures. Why would he introduce in a partimento consisting only of half notes and quarter notes, only at the end for eight notes? Obviously, because this introduces a new texture, a texture which introduces a texture in three voices. This is the typical texture with one laying voice, and one voice which will move in parallel thirds. When you look at the next partimento in A major, this is exactly what Finaroli wants his students to do. So the step from bar, I'm sorry, from partimento two to partimento three is quite difficult because the second one is fairly easy, apart from perhaps the ending where the level of realization is augmented, yeah? the quality is, is augmented with that, with that new texture. And that new texture, three-part texture, parallel thirds, laying note, is fully exploded within the, re within the reminder, actually, of the first book, but already within the A major partimento, which is a fantastic illustration of that. On the first, in the first half of that bar, for instance, you could put the parallel thirds in the upper voice, the laying note in the middle voice. Second half of that bar, you will do exactly the opposite. The laying note will be in the upper voice, the parallel thirds will be in the inner voice. This is so important for the student 
to that they can that, that they can learn this gradually, that they take their time to absorb all the different textures which are implied within those partimento to become fully acquainted with keyboard improvisation, with keyboard composition, because this is one of the major purposes of partimento playing, of, of this education. It does not, it should not sound as an exercise. It should sound as, as quickly as possible as a composition, as the improvisation of a composition. Uh, when you play just the basic chords, obviously this will not sound as a composition, this will sound as an exercise. This is the the difficult step to make, but the, 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 the absolutely necessary step to make. Can you comment on books two, four, and five? What somebody could expect and your insights into these other books that Fenneroli has? Book, book two um, is, uh, is, 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 let's say, um, is of another level. In book one, it's fairly, everything is fairly short and is an illustration of I would say, the basic rules. When he goes to the second book, what he does there is a full-blown training of dissonances. So already when you look at the first one, when I give the first one to a student, he or she panics because of the, because of the sheer amount of, of figures, but also by its size, and by the by the different tonalities, uh, even G minor within 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 uh, G major, etc. So there you see that Finaroli takes it to, yeah, brusquely I would say, to really another level. And it goes on. Every partimento is really challenging, and a real illustration, a real application of dissonances, both. On, uh, so dissonances in the bass, I'm sorry, and dissonances implied or explicit within the realization of the right hand. And as always, Finaroli anticipates what will come later. So this means that in the, in the second book, you will see already Moti del Basso appear. I think, for instance, of the B minor one, which is a beautiful chromatically descending bass in the beginning where he anticipates what will be seen later as a full-blown motto del basso. And again, in the second book, he still respects the same order of keys like he did in the first book. So he starts on G and he, he works his way up to the keys. So G, A, B, D, etc. And then if we, if well, that's, that's, the, that's the second book, really a very hard training on the on the dissonances. And then when we go to the to the next book, you speak of fourth book, I speak of third book, because this would lead me a little bit too far now, but I don't believe, I've written an article on that recently in 18th century music, I don't believe that the, let's say the organization of the first edition of the complete corpus by, uh, by Finaroli, the complete partimental corpus by Finaroli, is what reflects Finaroli as a teacher. You mentioned actually that, uh, was it in Bimbo? They kind of messed it up or they kind of put it in the wrong order. Yeah, so he, he it, 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 fine, it would be too complex now to get into that, but um, uh, indeed he mixed up, I believe, some, 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 uh, some series of partimenti. As I've tried to explain, Finaroli really explains things, cadences, rule of the octave, and then, as an application, he gives a series of partimenti. Then he explains dissonances. As an appli to applicate that, he gives a series of partimenti. And then, afterwards, he explains the moti del basso, on which he gives a long series of partimenti. And in Bimbo, yeah, he, he changes and he gives very simple partimenti after a more complex partimentus after more complex partimentus. So you see that the logical increase of, of difficulty is not there anymore. So he gets, like you say, mixed up. And actually what he calls, what Mbimbo calls books, book three, is only the explanation, I mean only, it's, 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 it's a big book, but still, is the explanation of the, motto, of the Moti del Basso. 
but it does not contain the actual partimento, partimenti on the Moto del Basso. For him, this is book four. Not only, but basically it's book four. So this does not make sense. So what you say is book four is for me um, book three. And actually all the manuscripts that I, that I saw, nearly all the manuscripts that I saw, confirm that. And one could say that book one, book two, and book three of Finaroli consisted his basic partimental course. And then what in, what in Bimbu calls book five, which are the more complex preludes, fugues, or the, the more contrapuntal uh, pieces, this is actually the, 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 the more advanced partimental course, one could say. And actually, for, for Imbimbo's, yeah, I mean, Finaroli was to a certain extent implicated, apparently, <laughs> within, within, the, 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 within the edition, yeah. but complained because he wrote to a, a student of him, Marco Santucci, that Imbimbo was preparing his edition, but it was full with errors. And so, obviously, a little bit, a little bit pity, pitiful, but for that edition, especially for that edition, Finaroli wrote to Santucci that he composed a fifth book of Partimenti. Not the sixth book, as they are published within in Bimbo, but the fifth book of the most complex fugal Partimenti you will, you will ever find. So this is, this is somewhat the, 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 voilà, the, bigger, um, the bigger picture of Finaroli Partimenti. And one should not forget that those, the most complex Partimenti by Finaroli, so the last book, what Finaroli himself called the fifth book, are, were actually composed only at the very, very, very end of his life, from 1811 probably, and he died in, in 1818. So that book had hardly any, if at all, importance, I would say, within the, the musical training of Finaroli. Can you talk a little bit about your work on Tonal Tools, which is a very interesting project, a book that was released and seemed to make Partimento and Schema Theory very accessible and relatable to even contemporary music? I, when, I, when I approach improvisation, I do it via the two different approaches, I would say. I would say the, the Sanguinetti approach and the, and the Gerdingen approach. So at the one hand, there is the there is the, the training, the partimento training leading up to even fugal improvisation. So along that, along that path, students have to improvise their own partimenti. So this means they choose a moto del basso. They make a structure. Let's say they start in A minor. They will make a modulation. They go to C major. They will make a modulation. They go to D major, they make a modulation, and they come back to A minor. A very small form, but a form which is very, very important within 18th century thinking. And gradually, this can become elaborated, this can become bigger and bigger. So this is the first way of getting to improvisation. The other way of getting into improvisation is starting by, let's say, by a genre which was so important within the 18th century to train composers, the genre of minuet. So this means that a minuet is a very simple genre in the sense that a student can oversee the full structure of, of this, this little piece. You start, for instance, in C major, you have eight bars in the first half, you have to arrive in the middle of the bar in G major. Then in your second half, again, you have eight bars, you will have, let's say, an excursion, so to speak, from bar 9 to 12. And then at the very end, you will come back to C major. And so in that other, that other way to get to improvisation, I really start from Mr. Gerdingen's book, starting with Romanesca, starting with Primer, starting with Fonte. And it is amazing that even with small children, you get very quickly into real life improvisation, even when they know only those three building blocks of, of composition, of improvisation. And gradually, you can introduce new patterns. For instance, you could replace the Romanesca 
at the beginning, which normally is followed by a little printer. You could replace it with a four bar do, re, mi. You could decide on replacing the fonte after the double bar line in the middle of the piece by a monte, for instance. You could elaborate your structure. You could tell the student, can you please play both a fonte and a monte after the double bar line? And could you make, instead of a printer of four bars, could you play two consecutive printers? One, I would say, standard one, and then, for instance, one more elaborated with a circle of fifths, so to speak. And from there, I get to sonata improvisation. Students who know well the improvisation of Minuet, from there on, the step to a small sonata form is not so easy, it's not so difficult anymore, because they have the same tonal path, so to speak. We just have to elaborate form. And yeah, before you know, a student plays, and I, I had one a fantastic student, he, he, he improvised a full-blown sonata with three movements in the style of early, of early Beethoven, for instance. And gradually, you, you, you make it bigger. You, you give more input. You give more possibilities. You give more textures, etc. I guess to end off, what projects do you have lined up for 2020? Do you have any events you want to plug? Any articles you're publishing? Uh, what's happening in 2020? I think the, the, the most important thing of I'm, I'm very, very excited about it. I am planning a text critical, complete edition of Finaroli Spartimenti. Because yeah, research has shown that this is really necessary. And it's also quite astonishing that one of the most important, if not the most important partimento maestro ever has not been honored, I would say, with, uh, with the critical edition of his fantastic partimento corpus. So I'm, I'm working hard on that. And I hope that, I mean, it gets really concrete within 2020. If not, it will be uh, at latest 2021. So this is perhaps, yeah, within this area is, is the, the, the most important thing which is going on for the moment, I would say. Fantastic. And I actually have a really silly quick question to ask you. I was wondering, you're such a master of 18th century and earlier and improvising and classical improvisation. Do you have a secret like pop side or jazz side that you listen to? I'm, I'm just kind of curious if you have a, if you listen to other styles of music. I, I'm just wondering. I'm addicted to Richard Strauss and I'm addicted to Richard Wagner. The, those two composers, and I don't want to explain why, because why does music touch? That, that, that is, you, you cannot explain it. But if I listen to... Uh, to the Alpine Symphony uh, of, of Richard Strauss, or if I listen to uh, uh, to the Ring, um, this yeah, this gets under my skin, and I don't I don't know why. And this, if I want to if I want to listen to something, this this type of music will be my first choice. <laughs> Wonderful. <laughs> <laughs> okay, actually, I do have the final final question, and it is this. If you could reform music education for young children from maybe like five to before undergraduate, how would you reform music education? And that's the final question. Well, that's a very hard one. I would say that, and I had the pleasure already of experimenting a little bit uh, with that, I would suggest to stop avoiding separating courses. When a child goes to his piano course, that that child is also informed really in music that he learns or she learns right from the beginning to speak the language instead of just playing the notes that the teacher tries to get creative with a certain with a certain repertoire obviously when when you are uh, dealing with 18th century music this is more obvious than than when playing chopin and and, and brahms etc but still so the connection between what today we call theory at the one hand and practice at the other hand, that we start to get rid of that, um, that, yeah, that wall in between, in between them. 
And this would be my, my the most. This would be the, the starting point of try of trying to to reform um, music education from five years on. But this implies obviously a huge investment of the teachers also. And this I have been I have been lucky to 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 to, to have been asked on on several um, yeah I would say training courses for teachers to try to very modestly try to show them possibilities because I don't want to be I don't want to I don't want to impose I don't want want to 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 say yeah I have the I have the truth that is absolutely not the case but I just want to show that the dry way of approaching instrumental lesson which is the danger I feel that you can make it wet so to speak yeah. <laughs> um, with, with, with that creative uh, side with that with, with the side of, of understanding uh, what is happening perhaps playing another note when you uh, when you play a repeat perhaps adding an ornament perhaps adding a trill perhaps changing two eight notes into four sixteen notes so this kind of hands-on approach, instead of putting the 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 the, the score uh, on a piedestal, so making it making it holy, so to speak. Wonderful. Well, Professor Ewald de Meira, thank you so much for coming on the show. I mean, uh, there's just, I mean, it could have kept going, right? I mean, I, it's it's so much fun to talk about this. And I think everyone is so excited about Partimento. And it's really, I think a lot of People are getting turned on to it. They're getting so excited by it. It's getting a wider appreciation. And your work is really stellar. And I really hope people check out your music because you've really recorded some great music, some great CDs. And they check out your website. And uh, I hope to be able to talk to you again really soon. So, Ewald, thank you so much. Uh, Have a great rest of the day. Thank you. It was a pleasure.